vroeg of laat vraagt een mens zich af, wie ben ik, waar ben ik, hoe ben ik. Succesvolle mensen worden door hun positie, bewust of onbewust, geconfronteerd met eenzaamheid. De een is ongemerkt op zichzelf teruggeworpen, de ander heeft er bewust voor gekozen. En weer een ander kiest eenzaamheid als onderwerp voor zijn werk. Did I feel that I had a destiny to be famous? Well, I think I was given that feeling by my father very, very strongly. My father uh, had great determination, and he taught me that if you had great determination and you had some talent, then you were going to do something in life, and nothing was going to stop you. He would um, have me recite this old uh, English poem, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods there be for my indomitable soul, my unconquerable soul. And uh, I, and he recited it not grimly, but with a great deal of zest and joy. And so I thought, yes, I am unconquerable, and I really will do something great. Now, I think my mother thought this was a very terrible way to bring up a six-year-old child, and, and so she always tried to emphasize that I had faults and that I should know that I didn't know very much, and because she thought you couldn't really love people if you thought you were unconquerable. And so I absorbed that, too, and I had a certain amount of struggle about this uh, between my parents, but I think I always believed that I would do something and nothing would stop me. August Strindberg schrijft... Door het contact met andere mensen te verbreken, scheen ik eerst aan kracht in te boeten. Maar tegelijk begon mijn ik zich te verdikken rondom een kern waar alles wat ik beleefde samenkwam, versmolt en geabsorbeerd werd als voedsel voor mijn ziel. Wat ik in eenzaamheid bestudeerde, bleek waardevoller dan wat ik waarnam in gezelschap. Amerikaans hoogleraar Martha Graven Nussbaum is gespecialiseerd in de klassieke filosofie. Het gaat haar niet om dode zinnen van dode denkers. Zij heeft een heel eigen weg in de wijsbegeerte ingeslagen en betrekt de emotie en vooral haar eigen passie in haar werk. Ze is hoogleraar in de wijsbegeerte, klassieke taal- en letterkunde en vergelijkende literatuurwetenschap. Ze schreef zes boeken en kreeg vooral bekendheid met haar tweede boek, The Fragility of Goodness, de breekbaarheid van het goede. In diverse landen ontving ze tal van onderscheidingen, waaronder onlangs een eredoctoraat aan de Universiteit voor Humanistiek in Utrecht. Momenteel is ze voornamelijk als professor in de rechten en ethiek verbonden aan de Universiteit van Chicago. Daarnaast brengt ze een belangrijk deel van haar tijd joggend door. Een recensent zei eens, Nussbaums theorie streelt mijn eenzaamheid. It's interesting thinking about this topic of loneliness. Um, I think loneliness in the sense of being unhappy because you're alone has been a pretty small part of my life. I've been... It has been there, though. There have been times when I've wanted a specific kind of company. Let's say if I've lost a person I love or I've broken up with somebody, I'll want somebody to take the place of that. Or if my daughter's away, like now she's away in Germany, I miss her, and I want her to be back because I want to talk to her. But the, I love being alone because I never really feel lonely. I always have ideas that I want to think about, and I have, 
I feel connected to people. I don't feel walled off from people when I'm alone because I feel my writing is a way of reaching people and maybe it's in some ways it might be my best way. So you always appreciated being being alone as a young child? Yes, as a child I, I liked it and I, I liked the sense of adventure and exploration that went with it. it. It wasn't a bad thing, like you couldn't do anything if there weren't other kids around because when other kids were around, they might not want to do the strange things that I would want to do, like telling these strange stories. And But when I was alone, I could really do any of these things. And they were certainly interpersonal. They were communicative. But they weren't always at the level of other children. And I think I've uh, often found that I related better to people who were older than me. The loneliness set in when you were together with the children. I think you're right about that, that I was more lonely when I was with other children in a certain way. When I went to a dance, you know, my mother would say, now, Martha, don't talk too much because the boys won't like you. And she had lived her whole life in this way. She had been an interior decorator, and she quit her career and took up the life of a housewife. But I also saw that she was very unhappy. Door de eeuwen heen zijn grote denkers het erover eens. Angst is het tegenovergestelde van liefde. Angst is ongeborgen en eenzaam. Liefde is geborgenheid. Er is moed voor nodig om tot zelfkennis te komen. Angst is angst voor het niets. Voor het weerloos bestaan. Onzekerheid en angst kunnen verlammend werken. Maar ook tot creativiteit aanzetten. Ze kunnen tot apathisch gedrag leiden of aan de andere kant juist individuen stimuleren grote hoogte te bereiken. I had a very um, keen sense of how scary life is very early and maybe it was just this way that my father used to take me out in the ocean, which scared me, and then he would make me come back in on my own. And I had to stand up to it, but I was really quite scared and miserable too. And I guess, so I had this sense of the scariness of life, but then also of the resources of human personality that could in some ways get the better of that. And that struggle fascinated me because it was the struggle I was in. And then, as I got older, I was in even more of a struggle because my family was pretty happy when I was a little kid. But then, by the time I was 10 or 12, my mother had a very serious problem of alcoholism. And uh, I had many emotions of rage and misery. And I knew I had to conceal all of them in my heart because I, if I said what I really thought then I had the feeling that my emotions would kill her. And so it was this terrible sense of pent up emotion, the sense that I had these angry wishes and that they were going to create destruction. And so I got fascinated. I mean, first of all, I was driven into myself because I couldn't find comfort in my home. And then I had to investigate those emotions. And I got started on things I now write about. I mean, thinking about what is anger? And what does it do to people? And how can we deal with it? And how, how can we stop society from being devoured? What is this drive, this, this, this need to always prove a thing, which is ambition, of course? Do you know where it comes from in your case? Where does the ambition come from? I think it may come, I think it comes positively from love because I really do love what I do. And I want to do it well because I think it, you know, you kind of profane something important if you do it in a half-hearted way. And so really it does come from love. And you I, do it also for somebody. But I think I also do it maybe for my parents and, you know, maybe especially for my mother, because I think, I think a lot of human creativity is a, a, an act of reparation for the damage that you wish 
towards your loved ones. And I think every child has great anger and resentment against its parents and almost inevitably because the parents have separate lives and don't attend to them all the time. But I had especially great anger towards my mother and I did, I suppose at some level, I wanted her to go away and not to inflict on me this difficult life. And so I do think a lot of my work is a, an act of reparation, a way of saying that the loving imagination can cohere with the rational argument. And in my new book, where I begin by describing my mother's death and talking about my grief at my mother's death, I'm still working on this book, so I don't know exactly how it will come out, but I think there, above all, I was trying to put my mother right into the heart of my work as a way of expressing love and, and, and saying to her, you're wrong to think that there's this gulf between love and this kind of philosophical work. Was it the situation that you were trying to convince your mother by reason and that she thought that it was sort of an easy way out for you or phony or not? Your heart speaking? Was that the situation? Well, did she think it was phony? No, she didn't really think reasoning was phony. She thought it was brutal and cold and callous. Cold. And so she would say, you know, no, Martha, I don't want any of your arguments. As if to say, that's a realm of discourse that we can put to one side because it isn't the way people really connect. Now, I never believed that, and I still don't believe it, and I do think that arguments are the essential way that people connect in society, but also in a friendship. Don't you think there exists such a thing as the um, almost instinctive way of loving? Well, I think people do have maybe initial impulses towards others. But if they're not cultivated through a rich development of imagination and through emotions that are themselves full of focused thought about the other person, then I think they're really going to be very unreliable. And even, it's often said, I think, that the mother-child relationship has this primitive physical character. Well, I don't know about every person, but my own relationship with my daughter has always had a dialectical character, and it's always involved a lot of conversation and trying to understand the life of another person. If I tried to love my daughter without thought, but just with this primitive uh, sense of merger, well, number one, she would hate that more than anything else, because she doesn't want to be thought of as part of me. She wants to be recognized as a separate person. And number two, I think I would be very ill-directed, inaccurate as a mother, because I wouldn't be able to think well about her situation, what problems she might have, what sort of a person she might be. Plato, de oervader van het westerse denken, laat in Symposium de filosofen Socrates en Alcibiades met elkaar in debat treden. Socrates zoekt de liefde in de schoonheid van de wijsbegeerte, onkwetsbaar voor fysieke en psychische ontbering. Alcibiades daarentegen stort zich op zijn passie voor één persoon. Hij waagt het zijn geluk te verbinden aan de band met een vergankelijk toevallig en onberekenbaar individu. Het goede leven en vriendschap als perspectief. You have there a Socrates who is cold like a stone and whose form of reasoning, because it's fixed on abstract universals only and it turns away the physical imagination, it's unable to encompass the full particularity of another person. And here's Alcibiades, and he's um, got, he's full of imagination and full of physical life and color, but he's an undisciplined, disorderly person who can't listen to argument and who's ultimately going to be self-destructive and destructive of others, too. Now, I guess I maybe saw Alcibiades as not only some image of my mother, but an image of my own you know, very conflicted and angry wishes that I was 
repressing, that I was keeping under control. And so the problem that I saw in that dialogue is, do we have a tragic choice between this cold reason that's unloving and then the mad, undisciplined thing that is going to destroy itself and everyone else? And the answer to that, I thought, was no, we don't have that choice, that we can think of a form of rationality that is more generous, that does encompass and use the imagination, and that is capable of investing people with their full humanity and richness. And so I think that's my life's project, is to describe what that's like. Whenever I have adversity in my life, my response has been to, you know, sit and work. However miserable I am, I've never felt that it made me stop writing. In fact, it gave me incentive to write. And as I lost tenure at Harvard, my marriage was also breaking up. But, you know, I wrote the last three chapters of The Fragility of Goodness at that time. When your marriage when was I, When was marriage breaking. was breaking up, my, I hadn't got tenure, I hadn't got the job at Brown yet. I was miserable, and I was eaten up by uncertainty and anxiety. But I sat at the table and I did this. And I think I got that from my father because he gave me the lesson that you always will go on. You will always realize yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever is going on, you're always unconquerable. For me, it's stronger now that I hear that you had this title in mind the moment your, your life was very fragile. I think that makes the book stronger. It makes the, the title stronger. Well, I, I think my life was fragile. Now, on the other hand, we shouldn't exaggerate this because I always knew I would have a tenured job at some good place. And so I wasn't in the situation of the person I just mentioned to you, a person who has to carry earth in the field 10 but hours you, a day. You didn't know if you could love somebody else again. You couldn't know well, that. Well, I couldn't know that, but I could guess. I could yeah. guess, you know. And uh, I never have believe that I wouldn't love somebody again, except for a few moments, a very dark moments. But I think I always believe that I'll love somebody else again. And I think, you know, what I've got is a very privileged life. And it's important to, to think critically about that and to say, look, uh, what is it that permits me to have that kind of hope and optimism in a time of great fragility? Well, it's because I'm well nourished and because I have political rights and because I have uh, a social background that gave me great privileges and opportunities. And so I think one shouldn't exaggerate the kind of misery that I had or that a writer such as Nietzsche had a very acute misery because there's so much greater misery that, you know, prevents the capacity of thought from developing. So I guess in my life I've turned increasingly from thinking about the fragility of a, a roughly middle-class life to thinking about the fragility of a much more acutely deprived life. And so I've come to be very critical of the Stoics because I think, while it's true that the inner world is very rich and it survives a lot that the world can do, I also think it needs physical support and institutional support, and I want increasingly to focus on those conditions. Nussbaum's filosofie houdt zich bezig met grote vragen, zonder pasklare antwoorden te verwachten. Gespletenheid is wezenlijk voor de aard van de mens. Zelfonderzoek is nooit afgerond. Weten en zekerheid houden nooit stand. Een mens leeft steeds verder. Elke dag is weer nieuw. Openstaan voor onverwachte impulsen maakt het sluiten van compromissen eenvoudiger. I think philosophy has a very close relation to psychoanalysis in the sense that it's a, an attempt to gain self-knowledge, at least the, the kind of philosophy that I want to write, does involve, I think, trying to create a, a text that promotes the reader's own self-knowledge. 
as Proust said, a text can be like a magnifying glass and you use it to look into yourself. So this is one reason I try to work with, with myth, with tragedy, with archetypes in which people can see their own struggles. And I think that can be therapeutic, not in the kind of popular American sense of a quick fix for some problem and, you know, we'll now feel happy again, but in the deeper sense in which we come to understand something of the complexity that's in us, and then we have a greater enhanced capacity to then move back out of ourselves towards other people. You are such a great writer on, on friendship, on, on philia, but then of course, uh, to be able to write, one has to be alone for a long time. So how's that? <laughs> I, think, I think that is an odd paradox that I, I write so much about relationship, but I do it, of course, in a way that requires this tremendous amount of solitude. Um, but see, I think, for me, there's a kind of rich friendship that actually requires that you develop your own inner world and your own spiritual resources. And I hope that I bring a lot more to a friendship because I am alone sometimes. I think kids that I see now, they very often, they can't stand to be alone because there's always some noise going on and there's always a television set and there's always some distraction. And I fear for their friendships because I think if they can't cultivate their inner world and they can't learn to listen to their own ideas in their head, what are they going to be able to bring that's rich out of themselves to another person? They're just going to bring the cliches of the culture. In Finland, it's totally different. When I was shown childcare centers in Finland, they showed me how they had built this particular one so that there was a corner in it where they said, look how we built this. A child can stand here and watch a bird and not see any other child. And they were really proud that the architect had designed it in this way because in Finland, the solitude in which you contemplate nature is an extremely important part of your flourishing. And when I go out running and I'm in Finland and you see another runner on the path, there's an instinctive turning away, not because they're unfriendly, but because they think you don't want your contemplation invaded. That's such an important part of their sense of richness of life. What moves me always, whether it's in a friendly way or also sexually, is this element of real personal investment and dedication. Uh, this person hasn't just gone by the cliches of life, but has really done something very distinctively that person's own and um, with great commitment and fearlessness. And I think it's impossible to do that if we're talking about any kind of intellectual life or writing if you aren't um, alone a great part of the time.